Hi, everybody. My name is Sam Nguyen. I'm a graduate student uh, at the Quay Lab at the University of Washington. Um, in the Quay Lab, we study uh, the mechanism behind different cell state transitions in the uh, immune system. But today, I'd like to share with you our uh, efforts in uh, building an unsupervised deep learning workflow for ex uh, exploring cell phenotype dynamics from light microscope movies. Now, um, in biology, cell state transitions are uh, uh, pretty much central for multicellular development and diseases. So what started out as a omnipotent stem cells um, at the beginning can differentiate into a, a variety of very um, functionally distinctive cells in your body. And, and these, this is a very carefully regulated right, um, process and any changes or any errors in such process can lead to disastrous effects as, um, such as um, causing uh, cancer. So um, from a biology standpoint, there are um, several questions that are central to how, how we can identify cell states and, um, and how we can find out the transitions between these cell state. And finally, what is the, the underlying mechanisms um, that drive these cell state transitions. So um, one of the most common techniques in studying um, and identifying cell state were, has been uh, flow cytometry and single cell RNA-seq. However, these methods uh, lack one principal um, advantage is that they are unable to, to give you um, a, a time resolution based uh, analysis. And that's where live imaging comes in as a very powerful tool for you to be able to not only look at um, uh, cell, cell state in general, but also seeing the phenotypic uh, heterogeneities in your um, in in your uh, microscope uh, in in your petri dish, and also you could follow uh, a cell population as a function of times and see how they switches from one state to another. Now. There are um, certain limitations with live imaging, and um, one of them, chief among them, is uh, the use of uh, fluorescent labels. Um, this is, uh, albeit a very powerful method, um, but they are, but uh, in order to create fluorescence label in your samples, you would uh, most likely have to either stain the cells or perform some sort of uh, genetic engineering uh, on these cells, and. This is tricky because uh, it, when you're dealing with uh, primary samples, i.e. samples that are taken directly from uh, patients or from a wild type animals, these cells are tend to be hard to, uh, to engineer and they are rather fragile to culture in vitro. And it's hard to observe these cells using fluorescent label. Additional fluorescent labeling has uh, carry with it phototoxicity. So every time you snap a picture using um, fluorescent light, the cells get a little bit sicker. So if, say, you want to follow a cell's differentiation trajectory for a period of four days, um, you have to take pictures sparingly. Therefore, you lose the resolutions or if you um, if you are greedy and take a many picture to get a higher time resolution, then you won't be able to keep yourself uh, alive for that long. So that that's that's an issue that we have we're facing in our lab, and um, and that that's why it um, it comes to our attention to just look back and um, and go through the most basic type of microscopy, which is a bright a light transmitted microscopy or bright field movies, and um, what I'm going to show you here is um, is a movies that we that we uh, record from a, a leukemic stem cell uh, primary cells that are um, directly taken from uh, from patients in uh, and we're culturing it in in vitro. And what you can uh, I hope uh, people can appreciate right away is the um, is the richness of um, information and um, let me see if I can used my laser pointer, yes. So you could see all the rich diversity in, in, in uh, the phenotype of the cells and, um, and all, all the texture, all the, so there are a lot of um, rich information here that we could use to in hopefully um, identify or analyze to, um, to, to infer back uh, cell states uh, just based on their, the cells morphologies. Uh, so I'm gonna, 
uh, uh, using bright field microscopy. First of all, is that it's a continuous measurement, and this is because light mic uh, microscopy um, is basically very cheap, and every time you take a picture, these cells do not get sicker over time. So you could get these very high resolution, very high um, um, time resolution movies without worrying that the cell is going to be turfed so much. And um, you can use the information, the morphological information being present here in order to to analyze the cells, right, to understand its phenotype. And finally, um, they uh, you can directly observe the cells and there's no need for genetic engineering. However, so um, why is this approach not as popular as fluorescent microscopy? And that's um, mainly because these are looking at, um, much like um, the, you know, a picture of a cat or a picture of a, a face of a human, they are very, they're very complex. Um, and and it's, uh, it is no trivial task to try to um, so somehow capture the richness of the morphologies in, in these bright, bright few images. And uh, furthermore, um, this is, um, as, as a grad student, this is what we have to do before uh, the advance of deep learning is that we have, uh, this is one field of view, we have hundreds of these field of views and we have to go through this movie uh, manually or uh, with some uh, poor undergrads um, and we have to uh, try to see or um, determine what kind of features that are important um, for for the uh, biological process that we're studying, for example, stem cell, uh, drug treatments. So what is the morphology that is interesting to to these kind of um, to to the biological process that we're interested in, and and um, and it's tricky because there's just so many uh, things going on, and the movies is long, so we so it's it's very challenging to to determine. Uh, the important features uh, but that is associated with the biological uh, properties that we want. That's why we're interested in building a deep learning based um, method that could be used as an unbiased, um, as little human um, bias as possible in the, to, to explore the cellular morphology in bright field, right? So we could look at, um, we could build something that basically can go through the movie for us and then discover uh, different cell phenotypic taste um, and uh, based on how the cell looks like, right? And we want it to be, first of all, an unsupervised learning uh, method uh, that, does, that requires no predetermined class or um, feature selections. Uh, because sometimes when you are going through this movie, it's hard to know what cell types are there to begin with uh, or what to expect. And finally, uh, in order for for our deep learning or unsupervised, especially unsupervised learning techniques, for it to be useful to biologists, um, um, it needs to have uh, the features that are learned needs to be interpretable. Like it has to make some sense, and um, this has always been a challenge in the field of deep learning to begin with. So, so uh, another motivations that we are. Uh, that that compel us to try to build something new is um, because we we go through current um, techniques on trying to um, that has tried to understand or analyze bright field images and we found that it's either address one of those uh, challenges that I uh, suggested before or um, but it never uh, none of them has uh, as as far as we know or are able to address both right so. Um, there are deep learning uh, methods out there that um, that use supervised analysis to either um, uh, make a predictions of a cell state, or you would need some sort of preconceived knowledge of what cell type are there, or what cell class are there. Um, or you could go the other route where you segment the cells and then you feed it through a series of defined equations that describe shape, size, texture. And uh, you can also do that, um, but there are again there are un there are supervised methods. And uh, in terms of unsupervised method, there are some self learning um, techniques out there. However, um, um, they are they are mostly generating these features that are useful for clustering, but not very useful for understanding what the individual features uh, means in terms of uh, shape um, or texture. Um, yeah, so so um, 
So that's where we're, we're, we're trying to, hoping to build. Um, and our pipeline or our workflow is called uh, Upside. That is um, standing for uh, unbiased phenotypic state identification from bright field. And um, uh, I'm going to briefly go through uh, what it uh, um, consists of. So, so the the way the workflow works is uh, it's going to be like this. So we have a stack of uh, of time lapse uh, images, and um, the first thing we're going to do is oops, we're going to um, have to identify these cells from these movies. And for that, excuse me, um, we're going to use the UNet architecture that uh, um, Carlos mentions uh, before, and here. We are um, uh, the Allen Institute has generally um, generously um, uh, help us with that, and um, so it, it was. So using this architecture, we were able to segment these cells uh, directly from bright field. And so after that, what we're going to do is we take these uh, crop image of individual cells and we put it through uh, a deep learning uh, architecture called a variational autoencoder. And this is an unsupervised learning um, our architecture. And what it does is that it compress um, each image of a cell into uh, a vector barcode. And this, uh, from there, this vector barcode, um, we could use these barcodes for dimensional reductions uh, or to clustering to identify phenotypic states. Or, and because this is a movie, we could also use it to analyze um, the state changes over time. And more importantly, with these um, using uh, an autoencoder or a variational autoencoder in this case, we could take these um, these uh, vectors and feed it back to the decoder of the variational encoder, and uh, it would generate a synthetic image. Um, and that would be used. Uh, that we would take advantage of that to to perform feature interpretations. Um, I will describe that in detail uh, shortly. So, to give a, uh, um, everyone a little bit more details on what happens in their self learning uh, process is um, here. So we have all the cro uh, crop cells. And what we did is we did some pre-processing with these cells. We eliminate the cells rotational, translational uh, moments, uh, like the trivial variations in the cells. And then we uh, extract first, we extract the texture in, in a movie, uh, in, the, in the cell crop, like the granularity, the pixel lightness value. And um, we also extract the shape of the cells because the, the sizes and and, uh, and 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 the bendiness of the cells are are very also very interesting, and um, so these two uh, general informations are fed into two concurrent variation autoencoder, and what it does is that it's going to spit out a um, a 100 uh, vector element vectors that is correlating um, to the texture of the cells and another 100 element vector that's uh, correlated to the shape um, of the cells. Uh, we concatenate them together and uh, we use this for analysis. And as for um, trying to decode and understand individual latent dimensions, what we do here is uh, we, we perform this trick where we have, um, so if you have a, um, a populations of uh, our distributions of your data in, in the latent dimension space, um, uh, you can extract the mean vector of your data. Um, and what and you can feed that through the decoder and what it's going to give you is uh, a texture and a shape um, synthetic image of, uh, of basically the representation of what a mean shape of your data look like or a, and a mean texture of your data look like and say if you're interested in oh i want to know what this uh, specific uh, features in my uh, barcode um, and I want to know what it's represent in a texture space, space or in a shape space. Um, what we could do is we could uh, arithmetically enhance that features um, to create a new vectors with uh, with that feature being dominated uh, compared to the mean uh, vectors. And we could feed that again through a decoder, and that would uh, give us an image, a new synthetic image um, that has that uh, specific feature of inquiry uh, being dominated. And there, from comparing the new synthetic image to the original mean derived image, we can uh, say something about what that uh, feature specifically describes. For example, here, 
uh, this the new cell, the synthetic cell, is a big, a lot rounder and larger compared to the, the mean cell. So we can extract that. Uh, we can uh, infer that these features, um, specific feature in this barcode, probably uh, represent some uh, sort of an increases in roundness and size of the cells. So um, and and this this feature this this analysis is powerful is because um, you could. Uh, now know some some meaning ascribe some meaning to the uh, to the individual features and so you can use this feature and associate them with the biological properties of interest um, now i'm going to show the applications of this pipeline to uh, the analysis of stem, stem cell states in uh, acute myeloid leukemia uh, and just a very brief background about uh, leukemic stem cells and why this is an, an interesting uh, um, uh, 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 biological system for for uh, uh, in in the medical field and in biology in general, uh, because these these leukemia stem cells tend to play a very crucial role in acute myeloid uh, leukemia uh, propagations. Right, these cells have been, uh, implicated uh, as being um, for tumor initiations. Um, they are uh, implicated in chemotherapy resistance and relapse after uh, such chemotherapy uh, treatment. Um, so there, so it is of great interest for uh, for many to learn how these, how do these uh, leukemic stem cells uh, give rise to other differentiated cells type in the uh, cancer cells type in the tumor, and um, what, and more importantly, what is the morphology of these uh, leukemic stem cells? Uh, what do they look like? Um, and how can we distinguish them between the, these cells and the differentiated populations? And we thought this is a very uh, appropriate analysis for our uh, pipeline because, first of all, uh, leukemic stem cells um, does not have an effective cell line for these. So if you want to study uh, this process, uh, most likely um, you will have to use a primary patient samples, um, which is, um, and these cells have been notoriously difficult to uh, to culture in vitro. They don't like any sorts of um, genetic manipulations. They don't live very well. So um, so we would like, um, so our method is, is ideal because it, it's required minimal manipulations for uh, for these cells. Um, and the experimental setup we um, is, is as follows. So we culture these cells in vitro, these LSC cells, in, um, in an environment where um, with the cytokines that we force them to differentiate in vitro. And um, all we do is basically uh, make a movies of them in bright field and watch them, watch the whole differentiation process unfold for a period of four days. And then uh, we take the time lapse image and then we just let um, uh, our pipeline uh, upside um, uh, peruse through the movie and see what it finds out about, um, about the differentiation process. So. Um, yeah, again, so we have this movie. We identify the cell uh, using the unit architecture um, and we um, then we, we we train them with the mask and the texture variation or auto encoder uh, and code them into barcodes. And um, for the first pass, we would like to see what's happening on a bird uh, view, bird eye view. And uh, to do that, we just basically project these vectors into a UMAP to the representations and cluster and see what kind of morphology call um, uh, phenotypes that we're dealing with here. So this is the result. So what you're going, what you're seeing here is the UMAP uh, representation of all the cells uh, that has been uh, identified by the unit architecture over the period of four days. Um, and these are all the clusters that um, we used um, a Leuven clustering algorithm to uh, clusters out the, um, the encoded vectors. And what we see is that um, upside generally gen uh, create uh, eight general uh, morphological clusters, and they are listed here. And if you go, uh, every dot um, in, in this in this U map represent a single cell, by the way. And so uh, if we sample some cells within uh, each of these cluster, uh, we would see that there are quite a few different amount of texture and shapes uh, variations in these cells, right? So example, uh, if you look at the cells that are in the blue group here, you can see that they are very small, relatively dark interior, 
However, uh, on the opposite side of the UMAP, if you look at uh, the cells uh, that are in, in this group, um, you can see that these cells are a lot larger, right? They are rounder and they have um, uh, this kind of shiny uh, appearance compared to the cells, suggesting that they are bulging out of the uh, of the uh, petri dish a little bit. And there we're also seeing uh, cells that are uh, elongated, whereas, but um, there are cells that are elongated, but uh, uh, to a lesser extent, so of our uh, basically a variety of, of different shape and sizes that upside um, have captured here. Um, so we could understand this a little bit easier by uh, just plotting the area and eccentricity or a cell edge strength um, in terms of pixel for these cells. And you can see that um, the, the pipeline um, unsupervisedly analyzed the, 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 um, the UMAP according to area from top to bottom. Uh, from eccentricity from right to left and um, to a lesser extent uh, cell edge um, strength from from uh, from left to right and we could also look into their uh, each and individual of these um, clusters and uh, examine their shape and texture and coatings and what we saw uh, was just with first uh, general um, bird eye view is that um, the, the text shape and texture and coding patterns um, the enrichment of these values are quite distinctive from uh, for from uh, one clusters to the next suggesting that these um, the cells that are a member of each cluster indeed carries a significant morphological variation from one another. Um, so we would like to go back to the questions of how, to, uh, what can we do to, um, or um, what uh, what can we learn, or what insights are we going to have uh, in and and to to find out uh, what kind of morphology is associated with differentiation versus stemness, and we're going to do that by uh, staining these cells with uh, in situ with CD34 and CD38 uh, antibodies. And what uh, CD34 is is, uh, is is basically a protein that lives on the surface of the, of these cells that are uh, very common if the cells is a uh, leukemic stem cells. And CD38 is um, is more representative of cells that are um, more different. Yeah, I, for, for for this slide, I was um, I was saying we're trying to um, basically uh, find the ground truth of the, the cell true differentiated state, so that we could associate it with the morphology that uh, our pipeline can um, um, uh, that our, our pipeline uh, have discovered. And to do that, what we what we're uh, going to do is we're going to rank the uh, the features. That are uh, settled, um, that that are discovered by upside, uh, according to the CD forty four CD thirty four correlation, which is a stemness uh, proxy here, and we're gonna take the positively correlated and the negatively correlated features and uh, basically decode them um, using the trick that I suggested before uh, to find out what are the morphology that are uh, correlated with CD thirty four and. And um, and anti-correlated with CD4, and uh, so what are we seeing here is um, is uh, the um, the the features that are in terms of shape that are most mostly negatively or positively correlated with uh, with C34. And the first thing to um, to notice is that um, there is quite a variety of um, of morphological. Um, features that um, that upside could um, could capture uh, in each of these late dimensions, right? You can see that it not only see you ge just general um, roundness or eccentricity, um, it can see uh, cells with different sizes, and you can see cells that have more nuanced shape, like um, this strange uh, this pseudopod morphology here, um, uh, big pseudopod, small pseudopod, long um, elongated bendy cells. And, um, and in terms of CD34, one thing that we can see with uh, the, the morphological features that are negatively correlated with CD34 is that there are a variety of them, right? There are cells that uh, we have round cells, we have slightly elongated cells, we have cells with pseudopods. Um, uh, but when you compare that with the cell, with the features that are positively correlated with CD34 and stemness, we can see that most of those features that are um, 
that, uh, that are correlated with stemness are ra rather um, representing small round cells, right? a lot smaller than um, the other um, than the other uh, from from the negative uh, correlated uh, features. And uh, if we look at CD38, it's the reverse where um, you have cells that are the features that are co negatively correlated with CD34 represent cells. Um, they have a diversity of um, of shapes and um, uh, in general, but they are uh, in general a lot smaller compared to uh, cells that are um, uh, that uh, compares to the features that are positively correlated with CD34, uh, CD38, which is a differentiated markers. So as you can see here, there seems to be, uh, in terms of uh, cell sizes, there seems to be some set of like a um, uh, uh, opposite trend here, where you have cells that are associated uh, with stemness is a lot smaller than cells that are associated with differentiation. So, uh, uh, so that's what. The, the the machines the AI suggest to us. Um, so we would like to at least double check that part. So um, so to do it to do that, what we do here is we calculate the mean area of each of the phenotypical clusters that we saw, and then we compare that. We plot that against their CD34 expressions, and indeed we saw that for CD34 area is anti-correlated with this gene expressions. Uh, with this protein expressions and um, for CD38, which is a differentiation marker, error is uh, correlated um, um, with with uh, CD38. Uh, so, um, which is again further um, suggesting that um, cell size is, is a big factor when to think about differentiation and stemness, at least in this, this cell type. Um, uh, a couple more interesting. Um, uh, insight that we learn by just looking at uh, by looking at the texture of these cells. Um, what we're what we're showing here is the uh, pixel map difference between the pixel enhanced and the mean picture of the cells. And uh, what we could see here is that uh, many of the cells that have high CD34 correlation um, carry a texture that has a very high bright pixel. Uh, so um, in the middle, in the inside of the cells, right? They they appear really bright or glossy, um, and as that's just in a bright few uh, context, it's just suggesting these cells are smaller and they carry they they are um, they have this round morphology. Uh, however, we're also finding um, these these enriched uh, texture features that are polarized in ter in terms of their pixel intensity, where we have. Um, uh, brightness uh, uh, only on one side of the cell and a darker pixel on the other side. So that suggests that you have a cells that are flat on one end and more raised on the other ends, um, uh, which is again uh, interesting. So uh, as, as I alluded before, this is a movie, so we could uh, observe how these different morphological group here changes as a function of times. And uh, what we could see is that with the differentiations um, uh, process goes on. We have a like depletions of these early cell compartments, uh, which contains um, long cell, elongated cells and round cells. But they are, are relatively small compared to their um, differentiated counterparts. And you could see that as as a function of time, these small cells, the early um, undifferentiated cells, depleted as these uh, larger uh, morphology um, start to emerge as the differentiation trajectory go on. And uh, we could further confirm that with you, um, by uh, tracking how the UMAP evolve. As you can see, um, the cell uh, start out generally with CD34 positive. As the time goes on, they uh, migrate south. Right? They migrated to the, the area where their large cell lives. And um, they start losing CD34 and really start ramping on the differentiated markers. This is very nice. Um, and finally, we would like to um, Try to see um, to to answer the questions how these um, so we have all these uh, morphological uh, phenotypical states and how the questions is how do we uh, learn uh, as a function of time uh, how stable are these states right how do they transfer uh, convert from one another and um, very luckily for us we're doing bright field imaging so uh, with this method we could. Uh, create a high time resolution movies without worrying too much about phototoxicity. So we ended up taking um, a picture in, in this movie every three minutes for periods of four days. And um, and we 
perform this very uh, simple linking cell mechanism uh, algorithm to uh, from one frame to another uh, uh, for the same cells, what are their state from uh, from the first frame and uh, what are the state from the second frame? And we can back out something called a, uh, prop a transition probability matrix. So um, uh, we could see um, for each of the cells from state uh, uh, for the blue state, it's time t. Um, whether how what is its likelihood of changing to a different state? And what we could see is that there are uh, quite a variety of different states that uh, uh, of tendency of uh, of these uh, of these cells in one state to stay or to go. For example, if you look at these um, the cells in this brown state here, they are this is a very unstable state. Right, most of the cells um, does not remains in the same state from one frame to the next and they like to jump around. Um, however, uh, if you look at the terminal differentiated state, the cells that are round and big and then gorge, they are uh, quite stable. Most of them, when they reach this state, they stay here and they don't try to 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 go back to their um, to, uh, to other kind of morphologies. So that's uh, um, also interesting to see. And finally, we would uh, since we got the movies, we could also analyze how fast these cells move and what are the shapes and uh, what are the morphology relationship in terms of uh, cell velocity. Uh, so we did the similar uh, analysis where we rank the features and then we ask uh, what are the features as positively or negatively correlated with speed of a cells. And what we saw is that interestingly, um, many of the cells that are fast carry this kind of uh, elongated uh, morphology or carrying some sort of a tiny pseudopods on the end with little legs uh, compared to the cells that are not very fast. Um, they carry just the general, um, uh, this round shape here. And um, so this is suggesting if you have a stretchy cells, they move faster. Uh, rather, if you have a round cells and they just roll around and uh, relatively immobile. Um, so uh, just a, a double check, we uh, we could measure uh, for each of the phenotypic state where we have the mean eccentricity and how fast that group moves in general. And we got a very tight correlation between the cell um, eccentricity and, um, and, and their mean distance travels, uh, which is confirmed the insight that has been suggested by uh, using our unsupervised pipeline. Um, OK, so in summary, we have developed a machine learning uh, image uh, workflow for exploration of cellular morphologies uh, and phenotypic state in their um, in the bright few unlabeled cell samples. And we apply this uh, this method to review insights in synthetic state dynamics in uh, primary AML cells. And uh, we hope in the future to to apply this to a more different uh, kind of cell types and 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 this is and this method doesn't um, not only works for bright few um, as long as you get a segmented cells um, as, or uh, any segmented cell, subcellular structures it should be able to to work as well and we'd like to try that in the future and finally I'd like to thank the Quay lab um, especially uh, Dr. Hao Yuan Quay for giving me uh, feedback into this project the Great folks at UW Medicines and UW Electrical Engineering, especially Pam, Ray, Sylvia, and Jin for providing me with the, um, the primary patient sample and give me general um, advice on the biology aspect of, of this project. And uh, uh, finally, the, the, the great uh, talk, uh, folks at the Allen Institute, especially Greg for suggesting uh, all of these uh, different um, a deep learning architecture for us to um, to to build this pipeline together. Um, thank you, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Sam. Um, so there is a question in in the chat, and I think this was uh, put in when you were in your kind of development section of your talk here. So yes. Shasha is asking if you can talk a little bit more about the texture extraction and whether or not they're done by the software. Yes, so the texture extraction is uh, done by the software, and what happens in in this method is we are um, we took the distributions of the uh, of the uh, pixels in. Let me see if I can find that slide. Um, yeah, so what we did here is we take the um, the raw 
uh, pixel distributions of, of the cells, and uh, we force the distribution back to uh, zero mean and standard deviations for all of them. And um, and and that's what that's what um, being shown here. Uh, additionally, we uh, we remove all the the, the uh, pixels that are outside of the segmentation range of of, of the cell crops, and that's what you're um, that that's what we use as the raw data for the um, for for the texture uh, variation order encoder. All right, thanks, Sam. There is another question now. So from Carlos, um, he's asking if you see cells that overlap, and if so, how do you separate them? Oh, um, that's a great question. Um, when we see them, so it's very easy to notice these um, uh, cells that have overlapped because when they they do that, and you're doing a two D microscopy, you can see that they become uh, they uh, they goes out of the field of view, and they become very defocused. Um, for those cells, we can't analyze them. We have to, yeah, we usually get rid of them. For most of the cells that becomes, that looks like they are out of uh, focus, we have a classifier that just toss them out, and uh, including all the dead cells, actually. So um, we, uh, so what, uh, what's not being mentioned uh, here is that we have another convolutional classifier whose job is solely to go in and get rid of all the garbage. Um, like all the dead cells and the cells that are touching and you can't deal with them, it would get rid of them before before you get to do this. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. I, I also had a question. Really yeah. enjoyed your presentation. Um, and and I had a question Thank. about your... So the, the, the segmentation that you showed is done using uh, using a particular network. I'm wondering, if you've tried different types of networks and found that the one you're using is the best, and how do you yeah. quantify best? Yeah, that's just a great question. We were uh, when we first started, we were um, we were uh, using a conventional um, segmentation method with uh, SON deep learning, and it it was it was very difficult. Um, because uh, as as um, as you probably see the the just the sheer complexity of the cells, so um, what we ended up doing is we tried um, we try a label free imaging techniques um, and and what uh, and what that entails is basically uh, we ask the unit to not specifically segment the cells, but we ask the unit to generate a fluorescence image of the cell uh, interior as if it's trying to um, stain the cells per se. So when uh, so in order to do that, we generate, uh, we stain like a small sample of cells, right? We use that as a training data um, to, so we th that's how we generate, uh, we convert every bright view image to a fluorescence, fake fluorescent image, and we segment on that. Um, when we first started, um, we were familiar with UNET, but um, as um, as you have seen here, there are so many uh, other architectures that we're we're thinking about trying on in the future to see if we can get better segmentation. For sure, yeah. So was was there? Do you have a set that has some ground truth, and then you're comparing against that for the segmentation and classification? Or is there an intrinsic method for qualifying the results that you're outputting? Yeah, so we have to do uh, your uh, the first uh, the first option that that you have mentioned. So, yeah, so you um, for every cell type that we're analyzing, right? Uh, before we have to put them on a four day uh, adventure, we take a small sample of them out, and then we stain them. And we um, and we train the computer to recognize the cell, those specific cells first. And after that, uh, when it's, pre it's ready, then we just set it loose on the four days movie. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks.